It's 5.45 p.m. Eastern Time, which means it's time for BCTV's weekly media roundup. I've drawn the short straw tonight. That makes me your host, Roland Boyden. I'll be taking you through the next 15 minutes into the regularly scheduled 6 o'clock news with an edition that uh, includes uh, um, taking you to Montpelier as the 2014 legislative session gets underway with the state of the state and budget address garnering national attention uh, for the governor in particular. We'll also talk about members of the ACLU. We're in town to talk privacy. We'll show you some of that, including the debate over consumer level aerial drones. We'll also break down Target's nationwide data breach that could involve your credit card and much more. We'll also, uh, Get into a seven-town summary that'll include a look at uh, the proposed AT&T cell tower and Putney and a whole lot more. We'll do it in 15 minutes. Heck, I bet we'll do it in less. So if you've got the time and the attention span, stick with us right here on 545 Live. first in investigated opiate addiction in an effort to help, he learned just how devastating it can be and how little most of us understand it. Be careful because your addiction is waiting out in the driveway, just getting stronger, just waiting for you to slip up and take you away. Welcome back to this November 17th, 2014 edition of 545 Live. I'm tonight's host, Roland Boyden. I'll be taking you through the next 15 minutes into the regularly scheduled six o'clock news. That's footage of Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin during this week's State of the State Address, an annual forum normally dedicated to a wide swath of issues facing the state's residents each year, but reserved by the governor this year, almost exclusively for the topic of heroin and opiate addiction in Vermont with Shumlin outlining an overhauled plan of attack that has garnered him not just the attention of lawmakers in neighboring states, but of uh, the national and international media as well, as his assertion that Vermonters can no longer expect to, quote, arrest our way out of this crisis has proven an effective launch point for debate. For more, we'll start in Montpelier, where hardworking Wyndham District 4 Rep Mike Merwicki takes uh, time out of his week each week to host himself and often other Wyndham County representatives behind the lens of his iPad camera for a live series of webcast uh, broadcasts that we get to show here on BCTV. It's uh, included this week an interview with Wyndham 5 Rep Dick Merrick, who talked a little bit about uh, some of the committee work of leading up to this announcement by Shumlin during the State of the State Address. Let's take a look. In our two committees, last year spent a huge amount of time working on opiate-related issues, and we really passed the, an omnibus, omnibus bill on that subject that addressed a number of the components of addiction, how to deal with addiction, uh, and had much the same focus uh, as the governor's address this year, which is why I think we were all really pleased to hear uh, an address that focused on that issue. Someone's appearances included uh, the National PBS News Hour, something you can find courtesy of his YouTube channel and take a look. For more on the topic, we bring in the latest member of our 545 Live team, Robert Stack. He's an area licensed mental health counselor, been in the field for a long time. Robert, thanks for joining us here and breaking down this issue. Is, is this a realistic plan from the governor? Well, I. I you know, I am so impressed and so happy that he actually put the spotlight on this issue. I mean, it's a state of the state address. He could have talked about his accomplishments and his hopes. Instead, he talked about a problem. And, and it's not just a problem that affects Vermont. It affects a lot of states. I mean, throughout New England. And it's a huge issue, and it's not an easy one. It's not a quick fix. So my hat goes off to him, and I, I'm so pleased that he did this. Now, by and large, the medical problem is fairly easy, I guess, on some level to take care of. You just detox them and you do it safely. Uh, the bigger problem is that folks who do opiates, um, they really, they tend to relapse and they have a high relapse rate. And so it becomes, a, it's an incredibly addictive. So I, 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 you know, I congratulate his idea that we're going to treat them. The question is, you know, it's a long-term commitment. I mean, it's not an easy fix. Often, uh, it seems like the consensus in the field is that you're talking about a, a lifelong affliction. I mean, you're talking about right. a, a emotional and spiritual ramifications that take decades to sort out. 
you know, it, it, it's really going to be there. I'm very interested to see how they're going to work this system, how they're going to uh, invest resources and time and effort. And I'm glad they're going to do it. And, and then, you know, every addict is different. And, and you and I have talked about this. You know, you can talk about addicts and addiction and how many people have died in the state from overdoses, how many people end up in emergency rooms. But every addict has an individual story. And they have an individual story about their journey how they ended up addicted to opiates, and they're going to have their own story about how they get better. So I, I think we have to congratulate people for paying attention, for making the effort, for wanting to get better, but I really, a word of caution that it's not an easy fix and it's not a short-term solution, and that if we're going to deal with this issue, we're going to make a commitment that's over time, and it's a commitment of resources and effort. Robert Stack uh, joins us live uh, from Studio B here. Robert, as always, thanks for joining us. You can catch Robert uh, this coming Monday live on BCTV right here on Channel 8 at 6.30 p.m. when he joins area psychiatrist Nils Kloster uh, for Let's Talk About Mental Health. All right, with that, we'll move on in the stories here. This week began on a startling note for many in the region as this Monday morning, parents and guardians of students at Brattleboro Area Middle School received an automated voicemail call from BAM's principal, Ingrid Crisco, alerting them to the fatality of an unidentified BAMS student whose death late Sunday night is believed to be the result of suicide. And while the death did not occur on school grounds and the middle school remained open and on normal block schedule on Monday, WSESU Superintendent of Schools Ron Staley explained that alerting parents was simply part of a district-wide policy. For more on this, we now turn to this week's reformer coverage of what's proven to be another brutally tragic news story to come out of the region. Take a look at the quote from the paper. Officers from the Brattleboro Police Department were called to a residence just, just after 11 p.m. Sunday, according to a report, and uh, upon arrival, a teen was found dead as the result of an apparent suicide. The report also stated that circumstances surrounding the death were ongoing and that no further information will be provided at this time. Yeah, and you can catch that full article uh, in this week's Brattleboro Reformer. Pick up one on newsstands or head to reformer.com where you can see those articles as well. Uh, now, the middle school remains open, but Staley did urge students to uh, seek counsel if they felt it necessary and assured residents that additional personnel would be on hand for that very purpose at the school. All right, uh, with that, uh, we'll move on in the stories here and hit a uh, 545 Live classic, one that uh, seems to seldom dodge the headlines, Vermont Yankee. That's right, all right. A high-profile public service board stop in Brattleboro via statewide web conference this past week was billed by some as perhaps the last time for residents to voice their concerns to the public service board before the state finalizes negotiations with Vermont Yankee owners Entergy Nuclear over the decommissioning plans for the state's lone nuclear reactor, currently slated to close uh, the doors to its Vernon-based reactor at the end of this current year, leaving behind more than 40 years of spent fuel, a form of radioactive waste that many area residents aren't particularly excited to see stay put. As Energy's time frame for determining the cost of decommissioning alone could take up to four years. And while four years may be a drop in the bucket when it uh, is compared to the 60 years uh, nuclear waste can lie dormant before re removal, uh, should Energy still opt to pursue the NRC sanctioned, federally backed process of Safe Store? Area affinity groups have been out and about in the early days of 2014, making their feelings on the coming decommissioning known. When the United States government said, in order to have what we need for energy in the United States, we are going to have to make some sacrifices in terms of land in terms of people's communities. And it's happened where there's nuclear waste storage. You know, you could talk about Hanford being a giant sacrifice zone for sure. Mm -hmm. They're never gonna be able to clean it up. Continuing concerns over the fate of the nuclear waste that remains behind even after the plant is closed. All right, uh, moving on. The rapid pace of technological advancements may play a role in just about everything we do these days, but one area most Americans would be happy to see left alone is their privacy, a constitutional commodity that's facing some tough times in the wake of ever-expanding internet use in our everyday lives, all of which is carefully documented, not always by the people you'd think. That was the subject of an American Civil Liberties Union-sponsored talk in Brattleboro this week, along with other more obvious privacy-challenging technologies like the proliferation, like the proliferation, technologies like the 
like the proliferation of unmanned camera outfitted aerial drones into the consumer marketplace, something we've grown to learn a thing or two about ourselves here on 545 Live, putting to work a sub $500 unit called the DJI Phantom, perhaps the most popular in its class, and one that, while uh, targeted toward indie cinematographers and low budget filmmakers, has raised a few eyebrows when used in the journalism field. If you're a newspaper operation, you'd probably love to have a drone that could be used to fly over. I don't know, a demonstration. If you're the police, you'd probably also like to have a drone to do everything from a benign use, such as searching for a lost hiker, to something not so benign, which is searching for somebody growing marijuana. Next up, if a trip to Keene in recent months has taken you through the aisles of the retail giant Target at one point or another, you might want to consider paying in cash, say some electronic finance experts who cited the recently exposed data breach that Target now says involves consumer credit and debit card numbers in the seven digits all across the nation. Uh, for more on that, we now turn to the latest member of our nationwide news desk, Landmark College broadcast journalism major and co-host of the Landmark Broadcasters program, the Nothing New News Show, Christina Osgood. According to Target, personal information such as addresses, emails, and phone numbers was stolen from as many as 70 million customers. Previously, the retail giant had announced that 40 million credit and debit cards may have been affected from a security breach. November 27th and December 15th. Target now says that information stolen is not a new breach, but was discovered during further investigation. It's that piece from Christina, along with several other students, uh, all part of the Landmark Broadcasters 2014 in-studio season here at BCTV. You can find all of their work on our official YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Brattleboro TV. All right, uh, we're going to move on here and talk seven town summary. That's right, the B and BCTV stands for Brattleboro, but there's seven other towns in the surrounding community that we serve, including Vernon, Guilford, Demerston, Putney, Newfane Towns, and Jamaica. And today we're going to start in Putney, where last night the board hosted a special open forum on a proposed AT&T cell tower. 18 years ago doing this, we were talking about big towers on top of the mountains because we wanted to really cover as much geography as we could. Low demand for the service because it was new. But as that demand has grown, uh, you know, the cell sites are being pushed down so that you do have more of them. But they're small and we can try to hide them. We can't make them invisible. But we can try through, you know, you know, design and sighting to, you know, to really try to, you know, mitigate the, you know, aesthetics. Just uh, with the few minutes that we have left here in 545 Live, let's take a look at the weekend's upcoming events. And for that, uh, we'll beam in to another uh, video upload feature here on BC TV on our official YouTube channel uh, that goes up every week. It's our interactive video calendar. I host that one as well, so it's more of me talking, but we'll take a look at it anyway. Let's see what uh, events we've got coming up. BCTV's Roland Boyden here, set to welcome you back to another edition of our weekly video calendar released each Thursday at youtube.com slash TV and brittlebrotv.org. It's all sponsored by the Brattlebro Savings and Loan. Saturday night, uh, head to the Stone Church for a 7 p.m. belly dance fundraising concert event. All proceeds benefit the winner. Women's Freedom Center. More can be found with the links at the bottom of the screen now. And with that, we'll move on and talk about the Wyndham Orchestra, who presents the latest in their Citizen Composer campaign as they gave area residents a chance to submit their own orchestral works uh, to be uh, arranged and performed by the Wyndham Orchestra. For more on that program, we spoke with uh, Hugh Keelan, maestro of the orchestra himself. I thought this, was, this would be a great opener to inviting community members who may not, actually preferably wouldn't have, professional training as musicians to write pieces for the orchestra. Not. We have Jan Norris, who runs Delectable Mountain on Main Street. She's a composer, and she's written a piece for orchestra that we're going to perform. All right, that does it for another edition of 545 Live. I'm Roland Boyden. Thanks for checking in. We'll be back next week with a whole other series of web uploads. You can find them at brattleboroughtv.org or youtube.com slash brattleboroughtv. In the meantime, thanks for watching. But uh, it's probably going to cut my head off if I actually fly it out of here, so I don't know that we're going to go that far. Get a look at uh, what our cinematographer camera angle looks like here.